Uh, ora, boa tarde a todos. Uh, obrigado a, a, vossa, a vossa participação e a inscrição. Uh, este vai ser um conjunto de, de quatro, quatro sessões. Uh, todas elas vão, vão abranger as várias áreas da, da Jura NBA, uh, neste caso as nossas ligas em Portugal, a parte técnica, a parte da, da dimensão uh, internacional, que será no próximo, na próxima sessão, a parte da estruturação da equipa e, 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 e de clube, e por fim, vamos ter, também ter uma parte ligada à arbitragem, que nós uh, uh, muito temos apoiado a, 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 e temos ajudado a formação de, de novos árbitros. Uh, hoje temos a presença então de dois, dois treinadores, uh, dois treinadores que conheço-os bem, o Alex Arama, de Inglaterra, e o Alessandro Nocera, de Itália, que aceitaram o nosso convite e, e vão estar aqui disponíveis para partilhar aqui uh, vários conteúdos que poderão ser úteis. Uh, para todos nós. Podes, Diogo, continuar. Obrigado então, Fred. Obrigado em especial a ti por este convite também para estar aqui com, com a Junior NBA, a colaborar com este projeto tão importante para o nosso basquetebol. Uh, Deixaria-vos alguns procedimentos para um bom funcionamento de, de, de mais esta sessão. Portanto, hoje faremos na, na seguinte forma, iremos dividir esta sessão em dois blocos de uma hora. Uh, blocos esses que serão compostos por 40 a 45 minutos de apresentação, aos quais se seguirão uh, 15 a 20 minutos uh, de questões. Uh, portanto, o ideal seria que ao longo da apresentação fossem deixando as vossas perguntas, poderão deixá-las em português, sem qualquer problema, uh, tentaremos dentro do, do, dos possíveis traduzi-las da melhor forma, no entanto, as respostas dos nossos treinadores convidados não as iremos traduzir para português para que não percamos tempo, para podermos ganhar mais tempo de formação e, posteriormente, quando uh, a sessão for partilhada convosco uh, através de vídeo, então uh, teremos mais tempo para, uh, em casa e tranquilamente, traduzir e tirar ainda melhores conclusões. Um, temos dois convidados para a sessão de hoje, uh, iremos começar com o coach Alessandro Nossera, ele vai-nos falar de, uh, portanto, individual improvement, Será ele então o responsável deste bloco entre as 18 e as 19, peço então que no QIA, que poderão encontrar então aqui nesta opção do Zoom, do webinar, que ao longo da sessão do Coach Alessandro possam deixar as vossas questões. Coach, uh, welcome, thank you so much to be here, it's an honor for us to have you here, um, you will talk with us about individual improvement, so now it's all with you and thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you to you guys. I'm uh, very happy to to talk uh, with the, all the coaches. Uh, please, uh, you can stop me when you don't understand something. Also, if I talk in English, uh, I prefer to to spend something some time more, but to be to be clear for everybody. I'm happy to stay here with uh, my friend uh, Freddy and. Uh, And Alex, there are two brothers for me, so I'm very happy to join this uh, this uh, this clinic with them. And also, I'm happy to to talk with the Portuguese uh, coaches and and uh, and, uh, and teachers. Uh, I start talking about uh, my topic. So we talk about individual improvement. Uh, very fast about I I really I really like to work. Uh, Uh, with the players uh, to improve them. I, this is my, this is something uh, that for me is uh, is the is the key of, of my coaching, is the key of my of my being. Uh, not only a coach, but a person before before the coach. So for me, coaching from the first moment I start was uh, was uh, was linked with the with the possibility to help people to, to increase their level, inside the court and outside the court. Without improvement, there's no coaching. Sometimes we think too much about tactics, about a lot of things, but if you don't improve your players, everything you want to do doesn't work. And then you need to create players that are able to do things, especially when they are young, because when they will be senior, the coach will create a system but at the end you need a player that is able to pass the ball in the right place to make the right decision to score to do this he need to be coached when he's young 
first, this is the this is the key of all my my lesson. For me, there's no improving technique without starting from the head. So without uh, a work in the head on the in the, of the without a work um, focusing on the mentality of the player, there's no improvement. If you without a work on the body of the player, there, no, there's no improvement. So first of all, is going in the right direction. There is, first of all, the mindset. Second is the body. So to be able to do things on the court. Third, but not less important, is what we want. There is a technical improvement. And this is the key of improvement. This is the key to become a coach that improve players. Understand not before talk of what I, we do, what I do, is important why I do things. Why I'm a coach that, that uh, why I have success when I work individual, individually with players. I think that I have success because when I was a kid, I was, I, I'm raised in a sports family. And when I was playing soccer, like in Italy or in Portugal, when you are like 12, 11 years old, I was, uh, I was a coach. I, I like to give advices to my young uh, uh, friends. I like to, to help the team to win. So it's something I had inside. I like to raise people. And this is very important because if our why is not clear, if our why is to, okay, I coach because I want to have a better house, I want to have a better car, doesn't work. For me, the best, the first thing of coaching is what you have inside. And if you don't know why you are coaching, if you want to have success, working with people, you have you, you, and you have to convince them to do something. You have to have clear in your, in, inside you why you are doing this thing. Because if you have clear why, you can transmit to them why they have to do the things. But first of all, you have to, to know inside you. Second, there is how you do things. Which is your style? how you, you manage people, and then there is what? Then there is the practice. But before the practice, there are two things that make the practice work. Without the why, without the how, doesn't work. How? So my why is to raise people. Second thing, how I work, how I, I deal with individual improvement. First of all, I, I, I put in a different color. So I mark this concept. When you work with a young player, no matter the level, you have to consider the future, not what is now. I, I tell you this story. When I was a kid and I was 15 years old, I played in my club in Parma. And one guy, was our teammate, he was two meters five, six, and he was the worst player of our team, by far. The club put him in the, in, the, in the second team, nobody cares about him. All of us, we were like 30 kids of my age, the 84 generation, all of us, we didn't go higher than, than fifth division in Italy. This guy, he played college, he played in A1, he was the only professional player, but the coaches, they didn't care about him because, because they didn't understand that he was the worst, but, but he was the best in terms of future. So this is an example. So, and another example is that every one of you, when you have a 13 years old, that he's the tallest, Try to understand if he will be the tallest in his future or not. Because if sometimes at 13 years old, you have a big guy, but he has uh, ears, muscles. So maybe you have to play playmaker. 
because in the future he will not be a, a big man. So maybe at 13 years old, as a big man, is is amazing. But at 20, as a big man, he will be short and not good at all. So this is very important. When you work with one player, try to understand where he will be. So consider, make this, and another thing, don't make decision for winning the game when they have 13, 14, 15. Think what the player, sometimes you have a good player and you put him on the bench because he's not ready. But like the guy that was in my team, you need to, to focus on the player that, that will be good in future. So try to make decision for the future. Second important about my style, how I work. So first is consider everything I want is to work for the future. I don't want to work for the now. The now give you a result immediately, but you are a low level coach because in the future you will have problems. All the, what you are doing will affect your future. Second thing is a person, the person before the athlete, the mentality, what, what, you have, what the player has inside. So focus on the person. So from the first moment, I, I hear I say a recruitment, you need to know who is he, what he has in mind. Yeah, but the only way is to speak to spend time with the player. For example, I was, I was in Stella Azzurra, which is one of the best academy in, in, the, in Europe. And uh, we were recruiting one player and he was big. He was big, strong. He was really a beast. And then we asked to him, what is, which is your, the player you, you want to be in future? And he say, Kobe Bryant. And I say, no, man. This guy must be the, he, he have to dream to become like Shaquille O'Neal and he like to be a guard. So talking with him, I immediately understand that that was a problem to fix. Okay, so when you recruit players, understand what they have, and then understand if they want to improve. Because maybe we see a prospect at other time. One time I recruit one player, he was so good. He was dunking, he was an amazing body, shooter, everything. But there was one problem. He didn't want to become a player. And I, I understand this too late. So it's very important when you have to invest your time, and sometimes if you're in a good club, your money, try to understand what the, the player has in his mind. Second thing, constant, um, talk with the player constantly because the player, the young players, they, they go up and down. They can change their mind. Uh, if you don't talk with them, if you don't understand what, they, what happened in their crazy mind or of, of a 15 years old, and we, we were 15 years old, so we know how, how, how the mind of a 15 years old, a 16 years old could be. Uh, it's very important to understand the, to understand what they think. So every time, like I put this picture because every time I speak with players, I spend time with them to make me and them on the same page. Another example, when I was lucky to, to participate to Jordan Brand Classic and I, and I share my the court with the Sigma, that was, I don't know if some of you, of you guys remember him, Jack Sigma he was a NBA champion, he now is a great individual coach, and he was coach of Houston Rockets. And he was the individual coach of Yao Ming. And he shared with me, that, with, with, me with the other coaches that uh, uh, when he was with Yao Ming, they speak together and they, they put on a big uh, wall what you can do, you can do this, you can shut, you can do this, 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 what you cannot do. So plus minus. And then what a center of NBA of high level have to do. So they 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 start to talk and they they uh, they make this sigma make this to make him conscious. 
to make uh, Yao Ming understand uh, at, uh, what they have to do. So he understand the process. It's not a start, a coach, I have everything clear in my mind, but I don't know if the player have this clear in his mind. So it's very, very crucial, it's very important to talk. To talk and make sure they understand where we are going. Then, another way of, of my style, so that to talk, to make on the same page, and then example first. I'm the first, uh, every time ready to work. This is the picture of me working at 10.30 with the one player, lights off, 10.30 p.m., nobody in the gym, only my assistant that make this picture without telling me. But uh, um, I spent my time, I didn't, I, did, I, I wasn't the first to go home. I stay with him more and I work with him. So I give to him a, a powerful uh, signal. I say to him, man, I'm here with you. I, I'm, I'm spending my time to improve you. So if you do this one for one player, he understand that he, he, must do the, he must have the same behavior. So he will do the same. If he see that you spend time, you spend energy, he will sacrifice for you and to understand how it can be important for, for, for him. Uh, I, I put, if we believe, the player believe. If we push, if we are the first, they start to follow us. So we can give energy to them. It's a sacrifice. There's no, there's no high, high result without putting some sacrifice and energy. It's tough, it's not easy, but I don't know another way. In life, it's not only about, about basketball. If you put something, if you give something, you have something. If you don't give, you cannot pretend to have in the back. And then I put this because the market is searching for leaders. Every year I have clubs that call me and say, hey, uh, Alessandro, we, we are searching for a coach with personality, with a coach with energy, that work hard, that want to do more and more. So I think everywhere, and I traveled everywhere in, in Europe and see different clubs, if you have this energy, if you are a leader that uh, can make people follow you, uh, putting more energy, spending time on the basketball court, uh, make them follow you with this, with this, uh, um, with this willing to, to improve, I think you will have a lot of offer as a coach for your future because people are searching for something like this in, in this world, I think. This is my, is my, in my experience. Now, then we start to understand another, another key for me of improvement. Uh, it's very important to build a routine. To improve a player is not only about the, the end, uh, the balance, uh, this is important. But to really, to really improve, you need to make him start to appreciate the work, to have quality on the court, to sleep well, to eat well, and then his mind change, like, and this is life. And then you start to have success. I do the same with myself about coaching. I, I have my routine. I spend time, I eat well, I want to have a perform. I always, well, when I go in Lisbon and I, I have to eat pastel de nada, I cannot uh, stop myself, no, but this is uh, when I'm in holiday. So when I'm in, in a stressful period, I eat well, I try to be very, uh, because I know that my, my, what I, I'm on the court, like I am in my body and in my mind. So, see some examples, we see LeBron James. When the people ask LeBron James, which is your, what is your secret? He say, my secret is, my routine starts from sleep. So the, 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 the easiest thing to do, sleep, rest, is part of 
of your practice. And then Djokovic, in this book I read, he's saying that the, the right way to eat changed completely his way to play because he had more energy, because he was allergic to gluten, he didn't know that. And when he understood this, he, he take another level. So my goal with them is to make them, when I, I want to improve one player, one team, some players, I make them understand the importance of a routine. In, so sleep, eating, have energy for practice and their routine. Because what happened? If you start, for example, to, sometimes I use a nutritionist or I use friends or maybe I find solution if I don't have a nutritionist in my club, I find maybe an agreement with someone that can help me with the two, three players I want to improve. I start to, from the eating, because if you start to eat good, you start to make uh, sacrifices. Uh, you have more energy when you practice, and then when you come on the court and you eat, you didn't eat chocolate because you want chocolate, for example, and you, you make sacrifice, you know you made sacrifice. So when you are on the court, you don't want to, to make a bad practice. You want to practice hard because you work all day for that moment. So they start to, to change their way of thinking. And so this is a positive routine. And uh, I read a book now of Marco Bellinelli when he went to NBA and he played with, uh, with um, Chris Paul. They spoke about routine, how routine is important to become a, a top player. But in, in every sport, I also in life, in every job, I think it's the same. And then you create a positive circle. So routine create energy when you when you coach also for us uh, and when you when you when you practice as a player and this gives results and more results increase the 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 willing of the player to do routine right routine and then positive energy then become a positive circle let's go to the practice uh, the practice is uh, i put this is very important physical work so you need to have a physical coach or to uh, search on youtube there is everything or to have some basics um, uh, uh, ideas about physical work to improve something uh, for example when i work on the shot uh, i know that i have to work on uh, stability on uh, uh, ankles flexibility um, some part the, the, the shoulders must be blocked and so I, I asked to my friend the physical coach to give the exercises so all, all my players when I want to work in shot with them for one month they do the physical uh, exercises to improve the physical part that you need to be better when you shot uh, and then and, this is the and then they improve only because if you improve physically then you work better. So this is an example of when I work on defense, you need to work on slide, cross steps, uh, running, uh, balance, stability, uh, one leg, two legs. You need to work also on the mind. This, for me, this is crucial. If you don't work on the mind, if you don't work on the physical, we, we are not making the thing at, at top level. When you can improve one player, you can improve in the team, with the team. Uh, you can, I, I, for example, in, uh, when I was in Trieste, all the, all the, all the teams, uh, uh, they did uh, uh, before the game, like NBA pre-warm up. So instead of shooting without sense, they have to do one routine about ball landing from, from shooting. So we put 50 minutes of individual workout. And if we have two games, it's 30 minutes of technique. Or for example, I work every time in the practices. I put some part of the practices where is there are technical part or physical plus technical part where the player improve. And then there are individual workout. So you can do, so 
you can do at the end of the practice, you can do before the practice, you can do before they go to school, you can do a lunch uh, break, you can do, for example, on Saturday morning, if they don't have school, you can do when they have in holidays, you can do on Sunday morning, maybe before the game, if you have a lower level game, or you can find a way. But improvement is crucial to, to make the things work. Because if they, if they improve, their mindset is a circle. Also, their mindset is better because they know they are doing something they need. And they know that you are doing something for them. And maybe there are some players that they are not playing, they have not so much playing time. They will feel, they will feel good because maybe they are not, they're not playing, but they see you are working for them to make them better. And so this make a, makes the team stay together, have a good, a good, a good clima. Uh, coherence between individual and team. If I work with something individually with one players, when we are with the team, we have to do to have the same concept. I cannot work in something individually, and then in the in the game, in the in the in the practices, I don't want the players to do some things. I need to, to work on the same line. I have to do the same things. Individual workout is, uh, um, individual workout is, uh, um, is based on basics, so the fundamentals. So when I work, so individual work, I mean, when I work individually, well, maybe one to one, one on three, small groups. But also when I work with the team, maybe I have six in one side, six in the other side, or maybe all together doing exercise in different parts of the world. So when I want to improve individually, okay, the player, um, I need to, uh, I work on the basics. I want in game situation, and then I need to have some tests. So they understand that they are improving, or maybe we understand we are not improving. So it's very important to work, but also to test. How you can test? For example, I work one, two weeks on shooting. Then I have one, one game, like you have to score, uh two three today for example i work individually with one player and we did uh, you have to score two trees from each of five position and i i take the time so we do this maybe three times and then 15 days later we do again and we check if he's improving then we can do a test of 100 shot how many he made and then we can use video so if i'm working on the technique you see that the technique is improving or not. So you need to have things when you can prove or maybe use the stats on the game. You have something to make them understand we are working. This is very important. Not, we, we, we cannot think, okay, we are good, if we work, we are the best. No, we have also for us, we have to, to, to test if we are really doing a good job. We have to have something practical, something that you can touch, you can see clearly that we are working and we are, we are improving. And also for the player, if he sees something clear, then he say, hey, I'm improving. I want to do more. I trust you and I want to do more and more. Then it's important the practice, but it's very important the game. In the game, you need to have coherence. So you need in the game to, um, you need to, to have the same thing. You need to, uh, you need to, um, not to, to do something uh, um, different from the practice. You need to follow the same, the same project. You cannot change. Uh, you cannot, uh, um, you cannot say to one player, okay, we are working on the dribble and then in the game you say, hey, don't dribble because you lose the ball. Doesn't work.
because mistakes are part of the process. You have to, to improve one player, you have to give to him the possibility to make mistakes. You have to give him the possibility on the court. Uh, if he need to do something more, so is something he, he wasn't able to do. So I, for me, the high level coaching in the youth, they allow players to do something they are not able to do and step by step to make them improve and then to add something in their, in their way to play. And every time you need communication. You need, we need to do, to, to build a process. We need to, 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 to go in one direction and we need to, to, that he knows where we are going. We cannot just do things and, and then maybe sometimes you, you, they don't know. Sometimes we think our mind is different. My mind is different than Alex's mind. My mind is different than Fred's mind. My mind is very different than Diogo's uh, mind. We are not the same. So we cannot be sure, we, we must be sure that we are on the same page. The only way is to, communi is, is to communicate, to make together work and stay on the same page. And then about the game, there is the Balkan way. I remember when I played against Saric, the now is NBA player, he was, he was, he had a lot of freedom on the court. Uh, he was, uh, for example, he made three falls in the first quarter. He stayed on the court. Oh, oh, almost never sub him. This is really a lot. But sometimes you have to give to one player, two players, the team in their end, if they deserve. If they practice hard, if they are good people, if they work hard, you must to give them possibility to lead the team. Maybe also to make some mistakes, but they have to feel you become a good player when you do something, when you, when you feel confidence. And this confidence, it's, a, it's also up to us to give to the players the confidence. Then build a relationship. This is very important. This is one player that I coached when, I, when he was uh, 14 years old and now he's, he played in the, in the, first, uh, uh, in the first division in, uh, in Spain. And we built, we work hard together, but we, I was a presence for him. I text him every time to put him in focus. Uh, I text him sometimes pre-game, pre-practice to motivate him uh, post-game. Also now we work individually with one player that uh, uh, he wants to have, uh, to go to the next level, he's very talented. And, uh, and I stay in his mind, uh, Every day, uh, every, I send a message, motivational message. I try to put him in the, in the right page, you know. So, and then I built a relation. He understand that I really care about him. And then I send video, motivational, or to some player to emulate. And then sometimes you need to spend time together with the player. Not talking about basketball, for example, I know that Coach K in Duke, he invite, uh, in his book, he, he said that he invite, uh, uh, invite players to, to, to have dinner with him uh, because, uh, uh, because he built this type of, of relationship. And then I have the example, I was in Monaco this, this, uh, this year, I will be next year also. And uh, I, I was close to Monaco Soccer. The Soccer Academy of Monaco is one of the best in the world. They create uh, Mbappé. Thierry Ari, uh, Trezeguet, Candela, too many good players, uh, too many in, in a lot of years. And uh, when, when I spoke with them, they say that uh, they work in everything to have the person, that the person is more important than the athlete. So if you want, and they, they say to all their coaches that they must talk with them every practice so every practice they have to talk every coach has to talk with at least one player individually because they want the coach to create a relationship with the with the young players then i have uh, one example and uh, this guy emanuele trapani is a pro player from italy i coached him when he was young then he, this is last summer he went to my seat in parma to train with me and uh, and uh, he made seven practices in three days 
uh, we had a lot of work only because he had the problem with his shooting form. He was a shooter before, then he had some problems. So we fixed his shot. I show you then some uh, video about that. And, um, and he came back to me because we have a relationship. And then in this quarantine, uh, in this period of lockdown, we work with Zoom together. And uh, tomorrow we go to work with him. So uh, when you build a relationship with someone, he trusts you and then you maybe you can work with him uh, for the rest of his career. And also it's good for us as, as coaching to have this type of, of, of relationship, also working relationship. Uh, I will start with, the, with video. And then we have time for the, for the, for the questions. Go ahead, Alexander. Let's go. Okay. So I show you some example. Then we go, we, we, I think you understand why I coach. You understand my style, how I coach. Now let's see what, what I do on the court. This is an example. Also was a practice I did online. And uh, this is one player from Greece that uh, we were together in junior NBA. Uh, and uh, we built a good relationship and so and so he, we had one, one practice with him online uh, but this is a good example to see how I work with the players individually so this is uh, first of all I warm up him with some finishing so he can uh, he can have a touch of the basket the mic and drill so simple now we go external foot internal foot stay low good position of the body, protect the, the ball, and use the blackboard to finish. And then, then we go, so I'm warming up, I'm warming up, warming up him, making some finishing, so I teach him some movement. So this is a very simple, a hop, so he, he, he touch with two feet the ground, and he go with a floater to, to finish. So up and finish. So we start with the board. Then we have this. Stay low. So he starts also to, to, have a, to work on his touch. And then we make it more difficult. So we work in this fake, the up and under. He cross with the feet, stay low with the body, and then finish. Same, he get his own rebound. Fake. Now he, he made a mistake because when he fake, he go, the feet is going too wide. No? This is a bit, you know, you saw this? When you fake the feet, this is a mistake. When you fake the face, must look at the basket. This feet must be at the same line of the shoulder and you have to stay low and to really fake. So you want to shut and you stop the movement. Then, now I add another movement. So we, see, we may made up and under, so fake, one step finish and now is fake, one step and then look, go back for a fade away. Okay. Which are the details? So I start simple and then uh, when I work with some movement, I work in the movement and then in the counter of the movement. So if the movement doesn't work, I give to a player the solution to do the move, the, the opposite movement. So he fake, he go and now before he was scoring, now we match the defense that react. And so he fade and the keys of fade are, now he's doing good because this part of the feet, or of the feet touch the ground. This is a bit up, so the feet can move fast. When you fade, you have to turn your head first, you see? When you turn is the head, the easiest part of the body, the turn, and then the ball go up, and immediately when the, this feet came back, the, the ball is up and I'm ready to shut. And then I do ball handling. So I start making feel the basket to have fun also to start to, to warm up and then we do ball handling. So these 50 dribbles, staying low, I push, I say to him, go intense. I say to him to, to go super intense, 50 dribble fast. Then switch end, the same, 50 dribbles. I correct him. And then is 10 dribbles. So the ball is up. You have to use fingers tip. 
he have to be so in a good, very good position. So he work also in his strength, in his leg, in his back, and then ten dribble, and then the, the hands from up the ball go lateral to the ball, and we work on the crossover, and the ball stay low, and you get again the ball in the same. Then the same, ten dribble, and then between the legs. Same behind the back. So I work in the three most important change. So crossover, frontal, behind, uh, between the legs and behind the back. And then this drill I like is 15 seconds of freestyle where you have to move, to move the feet, to move the hands, to, to stay low, to, to go under percent and 15 of rest. This is really tough, but it's very good to increase position, ball handling and feet work. And then he was dying. So I gave to him a rest. And then, so shooting for one hand to rest. Then go low, go low, also using the legs. Then two hands catch, working on technique. So using all the body now. And then again, so, Intense rest again, ball ending, and now sorry for the image. The same, the same situation freestyle until full court. You have to attack, you have to attack, and then go back to create separation. So, my goal is to move feet, to move feet, and um, stay up with stay low. Uh, power dribble. So, I want to increase dribble, I want to him to move the feet to go up and down. So he, he increases his, his, his dribble and then I work also in, in, in conditioning. And then, oh, and then the rest, the really intense work. So then free throws. So we work also on the free throws. And then he was not in shape. So we go, we go really simple. One dribble and finish to attack the basket. So the goals are to dribble and then strong attack, stay low, the shoulder go direct to the basket, the feet attack the basket. One strong dribble, one step and finish and attack the rim. So I use this like, uh, so we work on dribble, finishing in the first part of the, of the practice, then finishing using three ball strong and then touch uh, and then finish to the then five five uh, five score in five different position and then shooting form to rest and then the same with the left hand so one dribble now in this case this is not correct when you do this the ball must stay lower this is too high the ball must stay lower Again, five score and then shoot into rest. And then again, right, attack the basket, but he must go in the, you see now, he must go in the opposite style. So he can use directly the, bas the basket, but he have to go in the farthest part of the, of the board. Same, you saw, one dribble, one, two, and he have to go in the farthest part of the board. So five positions, and the same with the left. Same with the left, you have to go to the opposite side. And then game situation. So you have to score 20 points. And you saw he's free now. You can shoot. Uh, he can score uh, free throws, he can score threes, but he's free and he has to simulate the game and score 20 points. Um, then I'll show you another practice very fast. I want to show you... Uh, okay, I'll show another practice like this, similar, but from a, from a pro, check from a, play, a player's older. So the practice before was ball handling the goals, 
finishing, attacking the basket strong, and shooting form. So putting all together one hour, one hour, one hour 15 of workout, but you have everything you can do this workout during the season, before to warm up them, but I think you have everything to, to improve the players. The player then, this was the player I showed you before. So now we, we start with the car exercise. So we work on shooting four with the strong end, strong dribble and directly into the shot. So with the strong end and with the left hand, it's very important to have a strong dribble and then we work then the left hand with the left, put with the left hand the ball in the middle. So dribble, ball in the shot. With the right is dribble, shot. With the left is dribble and the shot and the end put the ball in the shot pocket. You have to stay low like you see now and we work on the technique. So finish perfect and push it with both ankles. So we start, in this case, we start with the shot. Then one dribble, the end is in the back, strong dribble and then not static but more dynamic situation or with, uh, with the right. So it's one dribble, another dribble to attack, one, only one dribble to attack, one, two, strong dribble and finish to the shot, working on the technique. Same with the left. It's the same goal like before, one dribble, another dribble to attack, the left hand, now you see, put the ball in the middle, in his shot pocket, and then he goes for a shot. Same. Other drill. Now I add a lateral dribble that is harder, so it's, not st it's less static, so lateral dribble, one dribble to attack, staying low, strong dribble, shot. We continue to focus on the technique and we are working a lot with him in these days on the mid range. So the, the key is to improve the pull up. So we start closer to the basket and then we go far. Same with the left, same goes. So one slide, attack. And now we have slide, imagine the defense react, come back and attack again. So we increase the difficulty of the, of the ball handling move and we continue to work on the pull-up. So one, come back, stay low. You see the guy stay low, the shoulder are ready to attack the basket. One dribble with the left attack. Then same change in side. So one dribble, go back, attack, right, strong dribble, finish. And then we use this work on pull up to work on pick and roll. So we, this is like the, we simulate the screen. He goes inside the screen. We move the feet, this feet get the space. He prepare the screen in this way. The name is like pack dribble. So he don't want, he don't want to make a change. He don't want to change and he, he just stay in this way. And with the moving the feet, with this small, with this step, he make the difference stay, go inside this screen, the shoulder go down, and then we go in the same situation. So it's pull up, it's the same situation of before, but in a game situation. So like I showed you before, basics, game situation, and then we have result. Same situation with the other ends. So I guess, and then we imagine, we go in game situation, so you can attack or if the, the defense, the big man, he's here to wait, you can also change direction. So you slide, you take the defender in your back, you make one dribble, you change direction. So we make then a technical movement like in the game. So we start from the basics and then we go to, to pick a roll situation. So real game situation in it. This is the same, same situation, the snake. So I'm teaching to him to play pick and roll, to change the rhythm. And then like Nash, so step back. So put the defense inside, one jump back like this. So 
the defense inside the pick and roll, I jump back and then I go directly. So I, and now we work on pick and roll, but it's another way to prep, to work before the pick and roll. So I wanted contact like before, but now he jumped back. So, that, so he has space from the defense and the defense go inside the pick and roll. And then we go two dribble and shot. So it's always the same movement in different game situation. And then is the same movement, but like we said before, the counter. So if the defense react, I go back and I don't use the pick and roll and I attack. Same, you see, jump, I yeah, go back, the defense react to defense the pick and roll. So I don't play the pick and roll and I go one on one. And then I work on a, a good way to work on the weekend. Like before, five basket in a row. So he shot, he take his rebound, and he always, he, he have to score only with the right hand. You see? Five different positions, you have to score five basket in a row using the left hand. See, three, four, And then he has the last basket, five year old, okay, you see? Then the same, but you have to score like we see before in the exercise before on the opposite side. Same concept. So when you want to work on this on the weekend, this is very good exercise. Five basket in a row on the strong side. And then you see, and then, in the opposite side. This is very, one of the best drill for improving the left hand. That is a problem for a lot of players. Also for him, that is a problem, it's something we have to work with. Five in a row, you see? Okay, this was it, but maybe I, I'm out with time. So then I, I will give to you this drill. This, uh, then these are uh, the same, this is one year ago when we work on the technique. So uh, starting, then th there is another practice I can do on, on shooting, but I will, uh, I will share with you guys. You can find on my YouTube, uh, in my, in my, you know, my, uh, my social media. So I will, uh, I will uh, give to you uh, also now, so you can uh, take my, my email for everything you need and for other videos. And uh, any question, I'm ready. Thank you so much, Alessandro. First of all, I have to apologize because uh, my English is a little bit rusty and I totally forgot to really do a, a good presentation of you. Okay, no I just tell your name, but I, I got to tell everybody that uh, uh, in the last years, you've been uh, uh, Italy national coach. Portanto, yes. now I'm speaking a little bit Portuguese. Uh, portanto, o Alessandro foi selecionador italiano de sub-15. E, e o, uh, é também atualmente, portanto, um dos conselheiros na, na área do, do basquetebol de formação uh, do Mónaco. Uh, coach, um, I have uh, some questions for you. Uh, first of all, it's coming from uh, uh, Bruno Caseiro, and uh, he sent us a, a question that uh, on the pedagogical regulation, if in Italy uh, you have something about this area, about uh, some regulation of the player development, or you can work wherever you, uh, whatever you want with the youth kids, if there's any document from the Federation that... Uh, uh, no, we, have, we are very lucky in Italy because uh, we have a great work from my responsible, that is Andrea Capobianco, then also Antonio Bocchino, they, it's 10 years that they, they go everywhere, every region, they make clinics, they give advices, also Capobianco organize courses, training for our uh, for our coaches so we have a lot of possibility to see to see how 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 we can work and how we they give idea our federation give a lot of ideas to all the italian coaches and then, so there is not, not like uh, like rules no? they give you ideas 
and uh, you can follow, you, you cannot, I mean, uh, everyone, it's very important for, for the Federation to increase the level of coaching. And it's very important that the coach study and they have the personality to, to make the players play and the club uh, believe in players. And so it's up to the coach. There's, so, not, there's no rules. So we can say there's some orientations Yes. But no rules, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Miguel Ruivo uh, sent us another question. Um, how do you plan your individual workouts depending on the athlete? Or do you have um, a general basic plan and correct accordingly to that? Uh, no, I think individual workout uh, is, um, is a lot linked with the contest. I mean, uh, depend if he's, uh, for example, now I'm working with some guys with my city that ask me to, to work uh, together. So, for example, next, in, tomorrow I will go in the south with the three pros and we will stay four days together to work uh, on some details. So, in this case, I'm completely free. When I'm with my team during the year, we have to, to, to understand the time when we are free on, um, on uh, asking, uh, talking with the with the physical coach, when is the right moment to do individual workout? Or maybe me and the other coach, we can decide not to practice and to do individual workouts. Or maybe we can, so I think it's something you have to plan every day. Uh, depend also on the player. For example, if the player, um, when I was in Trieste, several players, they, play, they, they work out at six before they go to school. I did several times. We work before, they go to school, then they go back, they rest at home, they do homework, and then we have practice here in the, in the late afternoon. So I think every, every player and every situation about club, camps, individual workouts is, is different. So it's very important to, be, to sit with the player, to understand what he needs, and to understand the contest. So also if he's good at school, if he's not good, you have to, to match with, the, with this life and then to, to, to make the right decisions. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. Um, two very interesting questions from, from Colombia, so from the other side of the ocean. Yes. Uh, we have um, uh, Johan ask us, um, what solutions do you have for these uh, following players, two different players? Players with social and family pro problems or conflicts and players uh, purchasing uh, power, players that, uh, um, uh, well, uh, who value nothing because they have everything. Okay. Yes. So, uh, we would uh, say uh, yes, yes. financial backgrounds completely different. No, I understand. Uh, I, I think it is, uh, also the other question were great. So first of all, thank you guys for this question because uh, uh, make me be more clear and uh, about my idea so thank you very much uh, this is a very good question because i think this is the key of my way to work with the players i think what i give you one example one clinic one guy asked me coach i have this problem i have one player that has problem at school and problem with family how you manage on the court with him and my answer is, I fix, I try to help him with school and I try to help him with the family. Because when you, if you fix these things, or maybe he see that you will really help him, then on the court, he will give you everything. He will, this is what everybody of us are searching in the job, in basketball, in life. If we understand that the people is caring about us, and he is helping me, I will do everything he, for, for him. Or at least if I'm a bit crazy, I will improve. I will improve for sure. I will try to. So problems, um, for example, background problems, financial, family, try to help him. For example, if he don't study, try to help him with study before talking about the call. Uh, if he has a financial problem, maybe you can take him outside to, to eat a pizza or to go in the best restaurant of, uh, 
and he will see, he will, or maybe if we don't have the shoes, buy the shoes for him. And he will understand that, that you really care about him and he will die for you. Uh, from the second question, if the player had everything, if the player like, uh, you have to, to talk with him and to make him become conscious, make him example, uh, maybe take him out and to, to, to open his eyes and to understand the reality of the world. You can be the richest guy in the world, but you can be sad, you can be not successful. You, 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 you cannot find the, the, the right point of, of life. And, and the, for us, basketball is a school of life before of everything. So I think the key is to make him open his eyes and understand the reality. So I will do like this. If the, the coach on the question um, say about power, if he's a power, powerful guy that wants on the court to do everything, I think he's good. I like guy with personality. If they train more than the other. If they train more, if they are the first, they can have personality because when they are young, when they have 12, 13, the guys that create more problems, most of the time are the guys that cannot manage their personality. And when they become older, they are the guy with the big balls that take decision. And, and so I think, I think it's very important to manage with these guys. Ok. Uh, David uh, sent us uh, um, uh, also an interesting question about the, 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 um, the improvement of players and they ask you uh, on the long term, uh, do you uh, follow the, the um, Canada example um, of development of players or uh, some ideas of uh, high school uh, American basketball development of the players? Uh, I think uh, I don't like to to generalize, no? I think I study a lot from everyone. I study, there's not for me, there's no Canada, USA, Italy. There are a lot of good coaches, especially now with the worldwide. Now I'm doing a clinic in, in Portugal. I mean, who, 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 10 years ago, who can imagine something like this? Uh, I think now the world is one. So you can have some good ideas from, from a country, from Finland. Finland, for example, is a country with a lot of good ideas. Uh, you can have good ideas from, now is in Hungary, for example, there is a interesting program in Budapest. Uh, you can have uh, uh, a lot of good ideas from all the world, I think. So, uh, for example, Argentina had an incredible schools in Bahia Blanca where, where uh, Ginobili uh, raised of, of past fakes, uh, uh, or shot fakes. Uh, the Ginobili style is the Bahia Blanca style. And uh, I, had, uh, I was lucky to, to have some connection with uh, one strength coach from, from that place. And so I think, uh, I think as a coach, we have to study, we have to be prepared, we have to have energy, and then to put the best, we think the best for us, because maybe the best for you is not the best for me, for my, that match with my personality. So I think every one of us have to, have, to, have to study a lot. For example, in these days, I'm reading the, the book of Antonio Conte. So a soccer a coach and give me a lot of good ideas. And, uh, and maybe, and I read the Djokovic book, the book that this was, it's a tennis player. So I think we, more we study, more we, we will be good for our players and for, for ourselves. Alessandro, one last question from José Oliveira. Um, imagine that you were talking and correcting all the time during the online practice. Did the kids re react well to this kind of video practices? Ah, yeah, for me, yes, it's something I also I never expect. I'm working with players from all over the world. I make a Zoom practice with India, I make a Zoom practice with the with uh, Greece, I make a Zoom practice in uh, different parts of Italy. Now I'm training one pro player uh, and we mixed uh, live and online. But the good thing of online is that I can work with him every day. I work with one guy in Slovenia every day. Because now with this thing, we don't need to match our schedule. 
we can just, I can give to them immediately programs, immediately advices. Uh, then it's very important because in the video you see, I was a seat. A lot of people are doing the, 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 the Zoom practice in seat. Then I did other practices. And uh, for example, if you check on my Instagram, there is a big, big practice we will organize with uh, with uh, uh, very important seller of the basketball things in Italy, uh, uh, online practice for who wants every age, and uh, I will be I will be with the ball. I will be there to see you. I think uh, if I'm sit, I can talk with you guys. But if I have to coach, it's better uh, to stay to have a position where they can see you. The key, if they can see you, is like in in the court, so they can see the change. They can see the movement. It's very important. This I think this is the the, the next level. Uh, I can I, I can talk, but it's very important. That at one point, if you don't understand, he see me and then he hear me and then it's like I'm, I'm there. So I, I I I it's better live for sure. It's better live, but online is a good way to to make more practice and to to work in the right in to to have continuity because especially in the off season. Now I will go tomorrow with these guys, and um, and I will put the video. So also, if the coach are interested, they can follow me and then see another videos. But these three days are part of a work. I will work with the blonde guy you saw in the video, but we just work one month, and then I will come down three days in his house, and then we will work again online. So because only time make results. It's not about, I can be the best coach ever, but one practice is better 100 practices than one practice. So this in, for, in this way is very good online. Alessandro, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to share your knowledge with us, your experience. I will ask Fred to, to also give us a word. Fred, Forza. Okay. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, I hope to see you soon and uh, take care my friend okay thank you so much no it was a real pleasure guys i i say thank you to you and now i will listen a bit to alex then i have a, a meeting so okay. i will leave in uh, 30 minutes so thank you obrigado hope to <laughs> see you soon in uh, in portugal in lisbon okay thank, thank you. you so much Alexander. let's go alex, alex. so we ask uh, alex Sarama to turn on the, the camera. Here it is. Alex, mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much to be with us. Now I cannot forget to say uh, your background or at, least, uh, or at least a bit of your background. So Al uh, Alex worked with the NBA. Uh, in Portuguese, uh, Alex trabalhou com, com, com a NBA uh, na Europa, no Medio Oriente, em África, sempre na tentativa de fazer crescer o jogo. Um, e foi uh, recentemente, portanto, diretor técnico da uh, Elite Academy, uh, não o sendo uh, neste momento. Uh, Fred, queres de deixar alguma palavra também? Uh, não, vamos já começar, que temos, temos já com, com, com algum retraso, é melhor começarmos já. Vamos a isso. Alex, uh, please start and thank you so much to be here. Pleasure. Thanks so much, guys. I, uh, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to do this. Just want to start by uh, thanking everyone. I mean, it's, it was an honor to really be part of the, the start of Junior NBA in Portugal. I think a lot of uh, people worked extremely hard from the Federation uh, to get it off the ground, especially the coaches on this call. Saw some um, pretty uh, familiar names just in the participants. I saw like Sonia, Ricardo, and a lot of others. So, you know, thanks for all the work you guys do as coaches. Uh, and I think some, some of the, the trips and experience I had in your great country are going to be useful for today, I hope. Um, and I, I hope it's just some really specific things I can give you uh, to help you work with some of your players, regardless of whether you're in the junior NBA or, or another co uh, youth coach. So what I'm going to be looking at today is a games approach. Um, and we're going to look at some specific examples at the end, but I, I want to make this as interactive as possible. So coaches, you can use the Q and A box, um, You know, if, if something comes up that you'd like uh, like to ask, please just fire away and I'll, uh, I'll cover it. So what is a games approach? It's essentially a way of coaching to ensure that the transfer from what we do in a practice session uh, transfers to the actual game itself. Um, and when we look at what skill actually means, 
um, a lot of the times we sometimes confuse technique with skill and technique isn't actually always skill. It's a crucial ingredient of the skill, but we forget about the decision part of it. So to me, skill is the decision and then the technique. And this is why this game's approach idea is really important because playing the game is what helps teach the game and helps players to learn the game. So if players are, are playing against more defenders, uh, it, it's a lot more realistic to watch what they're actually going to see in the game. Um, in a game, we don't see cones. We, we don't play against fresh air. We're playing against bodies and live defense. So, uh, you know, the technique part and one on zero, it's important and there's a time and place for it. But particularly if we're working with junior NBA kids who are younger, we want them to fall in love with the game and we want them to learn as quickly as possible. And this is why the game's approach is really critical for, uh, for this age group that we're looking at. Uh, and you can see here, we got Bobby Knight. And I think, you know, the, the old school uh, way that we look at basketball is, is a lot of drilling. And, and I think this comes from, from the US and maybe perhaps like the, the military link, the, you know, the, the military is very, uh, very strong in the US. And I think that's kind of where, where this concept of drilling comes from. Um, and I think nowadays with the, a lot of the evidence that we have based on how people learn, uh, the science behind coaching. This is kind of what's what's leading to the shift away from drills to more games approach type activities. So using a games approach, we basically don't we don't want to we want to avoid this quote, which is you go into a game, something happens, you turn around to your coach and you say, "But we just drilled this in practice." Um, so the games approach is basically a way to avoid this happening. So two key concepts which are going to be a, an important part of this presentation, and that's the idea of blocked practice and then the idea of random practice. So I've got this table here. Uh, you guys will get the presentation of this, so don't feel like you have to take notes of everything you're seeing on this slide. But what blocked practice is, is when we're just working on one type of technique and it's the same movement pattern repeated over and over again and there's no change. And often that movement pattern is dictated by the coach. So it's the coach telling the players what to do. So you can see the example of the picture there. That can be dribbling through cones using exactly the same dribble move every time, i.e. a crossover through the legs. That's blocked practice. All right? There's very little variation in technique. Then we have random practice. And random practice is increased variation where different movement patterns could occur. So a lot of the times that means, say for instance, you're playing against the defender, well, something different is gonna happen every time, okay, based on what the defender does. And a key feature of random practice is as opposed to just working on one skill or one technique, i.e. the ball handing through cones, you're mixing other things into it. So it could be some dribbling, some passing, some shooting. And that type of random practice is what leads to the best type of transfer to the game. The blocked practice is what we want to spend a very, very small amount of time on. Now, for some things, it could be useful. You know, Alessandro, in his presentation, he showed some, some finishing moves with the up and under. Some moves which are difficult and have some degree of complexity, you might want to, you, you're going to want to have some block practice, some one on zero time. But the idea is how can we make it as random as possible by adding different things into it? And I'm going to use this term on air a lot today. On air basically means playing against no defense. You're against the fresh air, all right? And on air is typically what we see most of the time with blocked practice. So the game's approach is this, this idea of random practice being seen a lot more. So I'm not going to play this video. It's very standard. This is just dribbling through cones. I'm sure everyone's seen that before. But, you know, how can we do some other things where we can still work on dribbling but make it random? Well, here's one idea for you. So all this activity is, as you can see, I've got a, a cone gate here. So I've got three pylons, three cones, one in the middle and then two on the sides. And we have a guided defender in the middle. So a guided defender is what I use a lot of the time so that we don't have to go against the on air so that there can be a, uh, some basic decision making element, which leads to random practice. So the job of the guided defender is to give the offensive player the decision. So as the player dribbles in, the guided defender is going to touch either this cone or this cone to begin with, 
all right? Very, so just some very basic decisions. And then it's live 1v1. So he's going to try and contest the finish. So this means the offensive player has to make a decision where they dribble through. And this means that the dribble move they use is going to be different every time. For instance, say this player here starts with the ball in his left hand and the player uh, touches this uh, pile on the guy, the defender. He's going to have to use a change of direction to get the ball into his right to pass through this gate. That's going to be different every time. It could be a behind the back, a crossover. You could add some constraints to that where you say you can't use the same dribble move twice. Um, so things like this can lead to that random practice. And so we can see that really interesting. This was a great skill. Look at what the player did to gain separation. Can you see him pushing the ball out there? Pushed the ball out and he ran onto it. He kind of did, uh, he did like a few extra steps. He did like three steps in one. And that's, that's what I consider creativity to be. Creativity is a solution to a problem. We can't drill creativity during it, teaching like a behind the back pass, really one on zero. Creativity comes uh, in when we're playing against live defenders to solve an actual problem, which is what that player did there. So you can see here just some more examples of that. And this is a good example of random practice because we're working on both ball handling and finishing. That is more realistic to the game. In a game, we would never just work on one skill at the same time. So lots of different places we can take this. Now, we've loaded this. I want to uh, define the word load shortly. It basically just means a drill, a progression. So now we're using, uh, uh, we're changing the activity. So this is what I call hot potato. So they're just dribbling the ball, passing it back and forth. And then when the player behind them gives them a decision cue to go, they, they could just say go. The player in possession of the ball is live and it's a 1v1 situation right there. Again, random practice because the defender is going to be a different position every time. And what you can see there is I have two players going at the same time. Now, a lot of the time as coaches, I used to be obsessed with having a neat practice. Everything had to look perfect. Boom, 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 boom. Players in neat lines. Um, only one person going on a basket at the time. But that is not relative to the game environment. The game environment is organized. It's chaos. It's chaotic. It's messy. So that means if we're using a game's approach, we've got to be comfortable with the mess. And having players go at the same time means, well, he has to get smarter and learn to avoid them. Otherwise, they're going to collide. It's, it acts as a constraint on what the offense can do. So maybe if, if he's coming down and he sees there's traffic in the paint, he might shoot a float or a pull-up instead. So we can't be obsessed with this idea of having neat practices. The game is messy, so the practice environment should be messy at the same time. Now you can see here some different, uh, I've loaded this. So now it's, we're, we're putting some ball handling in. Now, a lot of the time we see coaches doing these behind the back things, right? The, the kind of uh, pistol peat drills, you know, going through the ankles behind the back. I wouldn't do that in itself in isolation because I just don't feel like it has transferred to the game. You know, it's not a skill that is really going to lead to much in-game transfer. I'd rather have the players do something uh, like the ball handling stuff you did, which is actually game-like. But you can use it as a fun way to start your 1v1. So what we can see here is I've just given them a, a quick movement and they've got to do three or three reps. And the first player to do three is an offense. And the player who is last gives the ball to the per person waiting and it's live 1v1. So it's a race to compete. You get, get it done quickly. And then we're playing 1v1. And you can see you want to change the spots. Here you can see I've just done it from the 45. This was like two years ago. Nowadays, I would have them starting in a new spot every time, including the corners. Because this is a big mistake I made here. Because how many times when we're playing 1v1 do we only practice from the guard spots, i.e. from the top? That's a mistake. Because in a game, they also need to learn to finish from the corner, from a different spot. And that's also a way to make it more random because they're getting finishes from different angles, going back to that random practice idea that we spoke about. Uh, now just the, uh, another fun 1v1 for you. This is five spot 1v1. So a great way, like I just spoke about, to ensure we work from all positions on the court. I have five cones positioned around. The offense starts under the basket. The defense is behind them. And he's got to dribble to a spot, the offense, any cone he wants and the defense must go opposite. So if he goes around the baseline, the defender is going around the other baseline pylon. If the offense goes around the middle pylon, this defender has to chase. 
curl and chase. And then he's going for a chase down block. So this is a nice 1v1 start you can do to lead to lots of random practice. A great way to avoid layup lines, which I will come on to in a second. So you can see that through the middle there. And if you want to reduce the advantage, so this is a big advantage right now because the defense has to go all the way behind the cone. If you want to reduce the advantage to make it harder for the offense, they just have to touch the pylon as opposed to actually moving all the way around it like you can see there. And then it's a tougher contest, makes it a little bit harder uh, with the finish right there. You can also constrain it, some different constraints. You could say you can't finish using the backboard. So it has to be finishing with the net only. It could be you have to use the backboard every time. It could be you can only score with your left hand. It could be you have to shoot from outside the smile, the charge circle. So lots of when you're using a game's approach, it's very important to think about how you, you can constrain the activity to lead to different skills emerging. You can see here, that's, the, that's a new load I put in. Now we're going to do a dribble move to change direction. So we're, 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 we've taken one base idea and we've changed it lots of times uh, to get onto different things. So we had our 1v1. Now you can see we've gone on to some two on one. So we've got offense, defense behind, offense. So you can see defense following. Sorry, that was a one against two, my bad. So that was an offense disadvantage drill. I wanted to make it much harder for the offense. So now he's got to finish against his primary defender and his help defender. All right, great way to constrain a drill to make it harder for the offense. Now, you could also go 2v1, 2v2, et cetera, using that same stack start. I'm going to move on. So this idea of block versus random practice, I've just got six things here, and I just want you coaches to spend 20 seconds, and I want you to figure out, uh, just write down, what is block, what is random, or is it both? Okay, so just have a think. Using the terminology I gave you, what examples are block, what are random? I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to do it. Aproveitamos estes 20 segundos. Alex, you can enjoy a little bit of water. And we give some time to the coaches to, to try to, to, to know where you can put the block or the random. Perfect. And I know this is a bit weird, but, you know, if I'm doing a clinic on how we learn best, I feel like I need to deliver the clinic for how coaches can learn best. So this is just a small reflective task. So I'll give you guys 20 seconds. Alex, do you want uh, the guys oh. to put something on, uh, you on know the chat? What? It would be great, but I'm, for time, Diogo, I'm just going to move on. And I'll, I'll give okay, the answers. Go. But if I had a smaller group, I would do that. So, <laughs> part, so partner passing. If it is, you know, partner passing, what that is, is just me facing a partner in a straight line, like two meters away, doing chest passes. All right? I don't want to offend anyone, but that is a completely useless drill. Because when in a game nowadays do we even see a chess pass being used? Hardly ever, only in transition. The game now, we have to make passes in all different parts of our body, all right? So if the passing was done just with you as the coach saying, all right, bounce pass, chess pass, overhead, that is block practice. For me, very hardly any of that would be, would be useful because it's just not transferred. However, if it's random and you're saying something like, you have to do a different pass every time, so it's like a one hand off the dribble, uh, behind the back, through the legs. You've got to do two dribbles before you pass it. If you're mixing it up, that is useful. That's random practice. So just a very small change that you have to make, and you are making a world of difference to your players and giving them stuff, something which is useful and a skill which is actually going to be retained when it comes to them playing in an actual game. Three-man weave into 2v1. That was a trick one. I'm sure some of you got it. That is block practice into random. Now, the three-man weave part is the block part. Two-on-one is obviously random because anything could happen in a two-on-one situation. However, I would challenge you and I would say three-man weave, I would not spend any time doing three-man weave ever, even going back into 2v1 because it's not game-like. When in the game would you pass uh, without taking a dribble, without even looking at the floor and then run and follow your pass? You'd never do it. So for me, I would just never do three-man weave. Three on zero pen and kick. Now, this is an interesting one. It is on air because it's three on zero. There is no defense, okay? And the drift is predetermined. So that what I mean by that is if it's three on zero and you're saying, 
you must dribble here, you must drift, baseline drift, you must go here, that is block. However, if you do it and you say, players, you can dribble wherever you want and you can move wherever you, you feel like is the, is the right situation, that's random, that's useful. Three on three half court, great example of random practice. Zigzag drill, my least favorite drill of all time, along with the three man weave. Block practice, completely useless, all right? In a game, you, you will never be able to guard like that and use a drop step. It's too slow. Alessandro spoke about the cross step, all of that. Playing live 1v1 is the best way to learn on-ball defensive footwork. Layup lines with the same finish, also block practice. So, um, comparisons, all right? And this is the challenge of using a more messy games approach. If you're using block practice, it looks, there's, there's, it looks like there's short-term improvement. Because it looks like the players are instantly picking things up. And with the random practice, it's a lot less quick. It takes longer. And it, it may, means the practice looks sloppy or disorganized to someone watching. All right? In a blocked practice, the practice will be impressive to watch to the eye. All right? It will be neat. It will be orderly. Players will have a high success rate. Whereas in random practice, players will be making mistakes. But that is what we want. However, it's the block practice which leads to inconsistent game performance. Whereas if you practice in a random manner, you will see the results in the 5v5 when it comes to playing, playing the game. Uh, and this is just a quote. I'll give, give you the books at the end. But a great quote from a book, which I've actually got right here. I recommend it as some further reading if, you, if you're interested in some of these ideas. It is called The Playmaker's Advantage. Uh, and this is a quote by the author from this book. And he says, replicating the same drill does not help the brain generalize the skill to the unpredictable situations faced in the game. Um, and that's just a great example of why random practice is so key. And we can see here um, Steph Curry shooting the ball. And shooting is an interesting skill because I believe shooting, you have to do some, a lot of shooting on air. Why? Because this is an example of, this, of skill in basketball where technique is the most important. And, you, you know, if, you, if players have a bad technique with shooting, you can do games approach all you like, but it's not going to lead to much improvement. So it needs to be a balance with when it comes to shooting. However, even when, it, when we come to something like shooting, all right, it's a decision. Am I open or am I not open? And so many times I see coaches never work on the decision of shooting in a practice, i.e. am I open, am I not open? And just something I like to do for that, I just call it two-on-one shooting. It's my favorite way to teach it. And it's just, we have a two-side right here. So this is what we call in the NBA, we call this a two-side, 45 and corner, all right? And you could notice here, I, I talk about NBA spacing. And I would do this even with U14s, where we want to space beyond the three-point line. We want to expand the floor to create more space for drives. So the defender will start with the ball. He will pass it to the offensive player, and then it's live two-on-one, the offense cannot move. So really simple way to lead to random practice because now he's going to make the decision, is he open, does he have space to shoot, or is he not open, does he have to pass? And that's just a really simple way we can work on decision-making within shooting in a random manner as opposed to just doing form shots. So something I do a lot is, is this concept of a drill makeover, all right? And a lot of the times when I'm watching clinics nowadays, I get great ideas from the clinics, but then I'm actually taking the drill that I see and doing a makeover on it and adding this games approach idea and adding all these loads. So here on this left diagram, we've got our traditional layup line. All right. Now, for me, that is a very, very limited uh, transfer to the game. For me, I never really, in terms of, we see the layup line used as a pregame warm-up. I loved what Alessandro spoke about in terms of using pregame to make your players better. For me, I would only do a layup line for like two minutes right at the end. And that was, that's kind of to let my guys dunk it, just to have some fun before they go to get loose. And that would be like the last few minutes before the whistle. Other than that, I don't do it because it's just players waiting in line, especially in a practice. They're getting not many reps. If you count it, a layup line with, with 12 players, they get two, maximum three reps every 60 seconds. It's not enough to get better. So how can we make this over and make it from a block, block practice activity to random? Well, this is something called perceptual layups. And this comes from Chris Oliver, Basketball Immersion. So guided defenders, that same idea that we looked at. And 
these defenders, they're not live. They're just giving the offense the, the decision. So he's going to step out. And now the player has to finish around the defender. And it's something so simple. But look at the increased complexity. And it means the offensive player has to now do something different every time. All right? They could uh, take, use the left hand on the, on the right side. They could do a reverse layup. They could take an extra duel. They could do a Euro step. So this is just a very simple way and means players can get more reps. They're working on more baskets and lead to different finishes emerging. Um, this is something else. We spoke about the two on zero. So this is two on zero drive and kick on the left. So you can see. Let's try it again. Just look. You can hear Ready? it. So he beat his defense. I'm coming to help. Kick it out. Good. Next All right. Person. So something like that has very limited transfer because the players can't see it. There's no context because there's no defense. The coach there was explaining a picture which she could see in her head. She was saying, you've beaten the defense, now you're going to kick it out. But an 11-year-old player, they're not going to see that. All right? A coach with 30 years of experience of basketball can explain something on air. With players, we have to show them. This is why I need to play against defenders. So just an example of pen and kick here. This is something I used uh, in Bologna and Italy at this junior NBA camp. So it's live three on two. Constraints. Okay, working on drive, shot, kick decisions. Okay, so just something which is a lot more game-like. Now, this idea of loading, which we spoke about, it's like a Swiss army knife. Uh, I'm sure you guys have those in Portugal. Uh, you have one base, and then you can do so much with it, like a Swiss army knife. And it's basically this idea of taking one base drill, which we looked at with that 1v1 stuff, and can we change it numerous, numerous times to work on lots of different skills? Uh, and it's great for saving time and showing the progression of how you can take start with one concept and then end up using it in a five and five setting. So let's just look at this great way to look at passing, how, how we can load just a very simple game. So this is what I call half court keep away. As opposed to teaching passing with, with, a, with a, in a line where they're just passing back and forth, this can be done two on two, three on three, four on four, five on five with two teams. And you can put them in an area. If you want to make it harder, make them play in a small area. Or if you want to make it easier, you make the space bigger. And the game is simple. It's the first team to get 10 passes in a row. So that means if the other team uh, touched the ball or, or the offensive player commits a violation, stepping out of bounds, traveling, the other team gets possession of the ball. So you can see here, they're trying to get the 10 consecutive passes right there. Now, lots of ways we can load it. First load we put in. If no one communicates the score, it's a turnover. So I want my players to develop the habit of using a leadership voice. So this is a constraint I've added because if we don't add constraints, some players will never get used to opening their mouths and speaking in a practice. So this is a load. Whoever receives the pass has to say the score for their team. I want to get all the kids confident, being able to talk to the group and use a leadership voice. So that's an example of a social emotional load now this is more of a technical load if the defense turns their back to the offensive player it's a turnover so this is what i call a turtle i want the offense to face the defense and be able to use their footwork to space pivot create more time and space and be confident handling pressure so that's an example of a technical load right there all right you can see her turning her back now we've added another load one you can take one dribble and pass off that dribble work on these, these one hand passes. Another example of a technical load, you can see some really nice passes emerging through the game. We're not doing it on air, we're teaching it through a game. And now you can see another, uh, another load, you can decide whether you need to dribble or not. Those are just four loads. You can take something like that and load it 20 different ways. Now, at the moment, I've just started reading this book by, uh, by Josh Waitskin. It's called The Art of Learning. I also recommend reading this if you're interested in, in the science of how we learn. And some great, great comparisons to a game's approach in terms of kind of like hard first learning, how your learning has to be difficult. And Josh Waitskin was a child prodigy as a chess player. And then he went on to become a like very proficient in other domains, martial arts, surfing. Uh, he became world class at that through applying kind of similar ideas uh, to what I'm speaking to you today about in terms of random, difficult practice. And the analogy I use is um, playing chess, all right? And 
a lot of the times we do as coaches, we do a lot of five on zero all right, or three on zero. But five on zero is what we see the most to introduce plays and concepts. And that to me is like playing chess and suddenly you're playing with the white pieces and playing with the black pieces. And just before you're, map, you're about to make your first move, probably going to move that pawn in the middle two spots forward. I'm just taking away all my black pieces and you're playing against nothing. And that is in basketball. That's what happens when we teach five on zero. Yet for some reason, everyone does it. All right. But what that does is now imagine you're playing chess. All you're going to work on is patterns and you're going to memorize patterns. And that's the same with five on zero. You're memorizing patterns, which aren't useful because you're becoming like a robot and you're not learning how to play. Whereas if you play against me with the black pieces, you're having to make decisions. How you move is going to be based, determined, determined, uh, based on how I move my pieces. Okay. You're not just going to follow a random pack, pack pattern that you've rehearsed before we play our chess game. Otherwise, you're going to lose. I'm going to beat you very easily through a false checkmate. You're going to read and react to what I'm doing. It's the same with basketball. The problem is, especially at the youth ages, going all the way up to U16, players have to know how to play. This is why with junior NBA, it's important we, we teach through the game. We don't, we don't want to be doing any five on zero or similar. We don't want to teach our kid, kids patterns. So why we use a games approach, a lot more fun than drills, leads to in-game transfer. It gives players the actual decision cues they will see in a game. It's challenging, supported by evidence and science, and it develops smarter players and smarter people. That's what all the science indicates. Now, some barriers to doing this. I will start by saying, you know, when I, when I was in the NBA for three years, one of the reasons I left was because I'm a big believer in this way of coaching. And it's very anti-traditional. And I believed in this style of coaching and I wanted to uh, have success in implementing this and showing what could be done using a games approach. So you will, in, you will encounter a great deal of tradition if you, like, if you want to use a games approach for your program. But you've got to stick with it. Just like this book, The Art of Learning, stick with it and you will see the results. You've got to be comfortable with the mess. Big part of it is getting buy-in from fellow coaches, especially if they're older than you. Something that I've experienced, I'm very young, I'm 24 years old. I've been coaching since I was 14, but something I've always come up with, I've, I've done clinics all over the world and it's older coaches who are like, it's always been done this way, all right? That's not the case, all right? If we, if we always do things the same way, we're gonna get the same results, okay? And we're gonna be stuck in that never ending cycle whereby people are always coaching the same way because that's how they were coached, all right? We have, in a modern 21st century environment, we have science, we have evidence, we know there's a more effective way to do things, okay? Games approach, it does challenge the concept that you're not teaching, okay? It's kind of like you just maybe throwing the balls out, letting the kids play games. You've got to use constraints. It's not just a, a case of setting up games and letting the kids play. You've got to use coach within the games. So a lot of phrases like hold, recreate. So that means if they're playing a game, you ask the players to freeze, all right? And you can actually coach within the game. It makes your games coaching better recreate get them to rewind back at the moment you want to talk about the decision and just speak about that all right so you've really got to make sure if you're using a games approach you're coaching within the games all right and it does subvert this typical idea of what a coach is all right we have this idea of a coach being someone running drills being very maybe authoritative not letting the players have fun that to me isn't what coaching's about all right it's games approach it's being more of a transformational coach um, and you know, this, the key reason why, why coaching in this way is so important, this co quote comes from John Kessel. He's the, the USA Volleyball Director of Skills Acquisition. They're one of the fe sports federations anywhere in the world that made the biggest strides uh, in terms of participation and performance at any level over the last like 20 years. They've, they've become like gold medals, and they've, but more importantly, they've had hundreds of thousands of kids playing in the US because they've started the games approach. Especially in a country against Portugal, let's be honest, you guys are competing against football. Football is number one by a long way. So that means kids, when they experience basketball, they have to love it. You've got to get them to fall in love with the game. How can you do that? Use a games approach. Make it fun for them to come to practice. And this quote from John, he says, we're not coaching volleyball players. We're coaching people that happen to play volleyball. Therefore, we have to coach according to how people learn best. So we know now that random practice is how people learn best. So that's how we have to coach and run our practices 
uh, with our teams. Now, I just spoke about transformational coaching. I want to finish on this uh, before, uh, before I take questions. So every clinic I, I like to do, I like to speak about it. Um, and transformational coaching to me is the number one component of being a youth coach, especially a junior MBA coach. And transformational versus transactional basically means that we as a coach focused on the long-term vision. Now, Sandra spoke about that with the player development. We have a player who, who has great, great potential. We're focused on, on them fulfilling their potential versus the short-term results in winning games. No one's going to care that in 2018, the Milwaukee Bucks won the junior NBA championship for Lisbon. In, it, no one cares. In six months, people will forget. What will they remember? They're, the players will remember how you made them feel as a coach. They remember the players you developed and the life skills you gave them. All right. It's, it's about more than just basketball. It's a transformational approach, especially at this youth level introduction to junior NBA. Using charisma and enthusiasm. We want to avoid using rewards and punishments. You know, sometimes, yeah, if you lose a game, you know, get them to run once and come back. But this idea of using suicides and coaching through fear, that's the coaching from the past. Um, being a role model, living up to the same standards that we expect the players, challenging our players to think, inspiring them, creating a feedback culture where the players can make suggestions to the coach on what they'd like to do more in practice. I love going to Sweden. They're, they're really progressive with some of their things. And they just recently up, up included some, some legislation from the UN where um, players have a right to kind of have a say what they want to do in the practice. It's just, just a great idea. Um, so this transformation idea is really important as opposed to living in this transactional area where the coach has all authority trying to control everything. I think if you use a games approach, you'll definitely be in that transformational, uh, side of things. Now for me, just three priorities. I mean, I, I went to about like 40 different countries with the NBA and I saw the junior NBA in a lot of different places. For me, the most, um, you know, interesting thing was seeing places where it was, where, where I felt like it was really positive and it was changing and impacting lives. And then places where it was still a great program and a great idea, but it could have been better. And I, I loved coming to, you know, at the beginning, I showed those photos of the league. Let me just get them back. It was the Lisbon junior NBA day. For me, this was what the junior NBA was all about. This photo on the right, hundreds of kids having fun. Everyone's got smiles on their faces. And there was one experience, I'm not going to say the country I was in, where I went and uh, it was the junior NBA finals. And this is when I, and uh, a kid was, uh, there was two teams playing in the finals. 12 kids were sitting on each bench. And on both teams, they only played six players. Six kids didn't even get on the court for a minute. All right. And at the end, one of those teams won and four of the kids were crying. And this is a junior NBA league, right? And for me, that, that summed it up. And it was actually then when I decided I wanted to, uh, to do my own thing with coaching and kind of show, show trying to get, make my ideas a little bit more widespread because that for me is trans, transactional coaching. And this is why I love the, the rules that you have in Portugal where different players have to play. And I saw someone actually ask the question to Alessandro on the last one about that. Yes, that is a fantastic rule. I highly encourage that because you do not know at 11, 12, 13, 14, who has the most long-term potential. It's impossible to know pre, pre puberty. Everyone has to play. And a key part of being a transformational coach is giving everyone playing time. That is a really, really important concept. Main, main, main idea of junior NBA. And that's why I loved, loved coming when I, when I to a, on those Portugal trips, when I saw that number two, to me, this is still transformational, building players' dreams. If I was a junior NBA coach, I would give players all the information on their local basketball clubs, and I would encourage them to go and join. My job would be to use the junior NBA program as a bridge to going on to play basketball and join a club so that they become a more formal player. They can be part of that pathway within your country, within Portugal. So for me, the top two priorities aren't even basketball related. They're transformational. And... I know I've, I've done this coach, this, this clinic on actually how to coach with a games approach. But the reason I put this at the end is because I think it's the most important. And I, this is what I want you guys to go away from this clinic with. The last thing is where the games approach would fit in, developing players using modern methods. So I've got, haven't put any like drills in here or anything. For me, these are the three priorities. And not just the junior NBA, 
but for any youth basketball coach, really. Um, and just some brushing your teeth ideas. So brushing your teeth, this is something to me that I would do every practice. So I believe, uh, I just asked Freddie, I, I believe you guys have three hours a week with your junior NBA teams, three different practices of one hour. And for me, that's actually some good time you can have an impact. I think that's a really good amount of contact time you have. So what would I do in, in those practices? FMS skills, functional movement skills. So that would be, someone asked a question about the Canadian LTAD model. Great example of that. It speaks about the importance of FMS. We're not just doing basketball. We're doing like tag games, maybe throw like some American football with passes. We're working on different things, uh, making the players learn different movement skills. And you can do it through basketball, but we're not just specializing on, on basketball specific movements. Lots of finishing practice, lots of 1v1s. You guys saw that in some of the videos I sent. Lots of shooting. That can be done on air. I don't like this idea of a lot of form shooting. I think it's a little bit too mechanic. Fortunately, I haven't got time to speak about it, but you guys will get my contact info if, if you're interested in some of these ideas. And then the last one is just lots of small-sided games. That means lots of two-on-twos, two-on-ones, three-on-threes, etc. Really, really important. I think playing with an advantage for 11 and 12 year olds, i.e. two on one, three on two, that's really important because it gives them a chance to have success. It's more important that they do that than playing five on five because they get a lot more touches and they're more likely to enjoy the sport. If they're just playing five on five. They're not going to have many opportunities to make decisions. They won't touch the ball that much. It's not going to be as fun. And I think you've really got to prioritize offense over defense. You really don't need to talk about defense, I'd say, at all with junior NBA teams. They can learn some, some how to guard the ball in one-on-one. -on -one. That's it. Nothing else. Offensive skill is king at this age group. And just a, another reflective task for you guys. I want you to think before this presentation, where did you sit on this scale? And we've got games approach on the left, random practice, drills, and ice isolation, i.e. block practice on the right. And I, I hope that maybe I've been able to move you a little bit to the left. But, you know, even if I didn't, that's the great part of coaching. Everyone's got lots of different ideas. And I think just the, the, the great thing about coaching is being able to listen to uh, lots of different philosophies and viewpoints on the, on the game. And then last thing, exclusive news. So I actually just left EA. Uh, I was only there for a year, but it's, it's kind of how, how life, life turns out. It can be very unpredictable. I'm actually teaming up with, with Chris Oliver, basketball immersion. So this is the number one, Chris, Chris has created an, an unbelievable platform, number one in the world for coach education. F literally thousands of people all over the world. I know we've got some members in Portugal. So if you're an immersion member listening, um, I'm looking forward to speaking more of you. So this is basically a whole membership community based on games approach ideas and many other things. Chris is a great follow on Twitter, but uh, I'm going to be doing a lot with, with Chris, traveling all over the world, doing clinics. I'm actually still going to be based in Europe. Um, which is going to make it easier to to get to get to do, do do more clinics over here. But if you're interested in the stuff I shared today, I do a lot of clinics and camps, youth camps over the summer. So uh, love to love to do another trip to Portugal. This is my contact info here, my Instagram and Twitter handles. You can DM me if you've got any questions, and then my email. Uh, please just don't worry about emailing me if you just want the slides because. I will get them to you through the Federation, through Freddie. I'll send these slides to Freddie so we can get them to you. But if you obviously got any questions on this, uh, then you can get in touch. So with that said, I'd love to uh, look at some of the questions. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and let's take a look at some of the Q and A's. So if you want to read it, it's, uh, I think you have the, the access for that. We have two questions from Jose Oliver and João Lima. Uh, the first one I think is really good for you because that's the balance you were speaking during your presentation. I'm going to read to everybody. So uh, this dilemma uh, about the, the random or the blocks, but shouldn't we work block until the player dominates the technique we are teaching after uh, use random? So I, I would say great question. Is there such a thing as a perfect technique? really, if you think about that. And through random practice, you can develop your technique working on the decision-making at the same time. So what that means is that when you're doing that, the technique, it's going to be ingrained within that player a lot longer. And it's also going to lead to them actually doing it in a game 
versus if you just do it block. If you do it block, you're, you're going to feel like you said, Joe, you're going to feel like they're mastering the technique, but then they're only mastering the technique in a one on zero context in a practice. And when it gets into the game, if you're just doing block, that's not going to happen. So the whole idea of random is takes a little bit longer, but you can learn your technique through random practice and you can develop technique through random practice. Uh, and it will lead to longer lasting and better results, but it takes longer than the block um, to answer the question. So I think, you know, a lot of people kind of have that dilemma and they, they feel like a player has to master a movement or a skill, a te their technique, sorry, before they, they do it in a game. And that's not the case. Like you can actually, if you put players in games, they will be forced to do things like dribble with their eyes up. They'll learn it very quickly. So that's where using a games approach and being able to load and deload maybe sometimes to make it easier so that it's at the right uh, level of, of difficulty. That's like a key, a key concept. Thanks. Uh, João Lima asks us, what do you think about differential learning instead of constraints led approach? So I don't actually know what differential learning is. Um, Jose, so if you can define that, great. I mean, constraints-led approach, obviously, I'm, I've read a lot on that, and that's something I do a lot. But just let me know what you mean, please, by, um, by differential learning. That would be great, and then I can answer that. For the coaches, constraints-led approach, that's just the, the idea I showed you with using, like, a games-based theory, but then adding constraints and different rules on it to lead to different skills emerging. So the danger with a games approach is when you don't have those constraints. If you just let them play, it's better than block practice, but it's not that much better. So that's where you've got to use constraints and have a think about what constraints you want to add onto the games you're using. Um, so that's the constraints led approach. The differential learning, I'll just wait to hear from Jose on that. But any other so, questions, guys, just send them in. So Alex, th this is mine. So you like the, that idea of uh, playing uh, a shorter number of players, like a three-on-three, -three, but for a moment, give some advantages to the uh, defense or to the offense. That's the kind of constraints you like to put on the drills. Yeah, so that's a, a good question. So three-on-three, -three, I think it's, it's really important for youth players. I think when they get to about 15, Uh, it's still really important, but that's when I'm doing a lot more five on five because three on three is, it's critical for developing offensive skill, mostly because if you think of three on three, the offense has a lot more space to work in and they've got more time and contact, uh, sorry, they've got more opportunities to touch the ball. However, that if we're only doing three on three when they're still like 15, 16, 17, 18, it's not realistic because in a game it's played five on five. And for an offensive player, you have a lot more time and space when you're playing three on three than you would in the game, right? So I think if you want to work on defense, and that's, that's like you want to emphasize a defensive skill, that using three on three is smart because it's harder for the defense because they got a lot more space to cover, right? As opposed to five on five. However, if you really want to work on offensive skill at those age groups when they're a little bit older, Three, just playing three on three, in my opinion, isn't optimal because of the fact it's unrealistic for the reasons I just mentioned. On, on the five on five, uh, if you want to work in situations like the, the collective tactics, like the set plays, uh, you like to first to do an approach of five on zero or you like the approach of a five on five? Five on five, messy learning. So I would introduce it five on five because... If you're introducing it five on zero, all right, let's just take a really, really simple play right here, and I'm going to draw it up on my board. So let's take, let's say, for instance, coaches, we're teaching a baseline out of bounds, a BOB play, all right? And let's do it out of a box formation, because I know a lot of youth coaches love to run boxes. It's a really effective way to play, all right? So let's just say we're going to do a screen the screener action. So we're going to set a back screen right here. This play is coming to the corner. Our screen, the screener is right here. So we're going to curl off the second one, look for the ball right there. Our safety is right here. And after this screen, we're breaking as the second option. All right, that's just one option. If I do that five on zero, this is all a situation of if and it depends on what the defense does. 
Okay. So when we look at the reads within this, you know, what if this player is open immediately off the first back screen? Could be a great opportunity for a shot. What if, as this player comes to set the cross screen, his defender jumps out anticipating it and he can just quickly duck in or seal to receive the ball? So there are lots of things where if you just do practice that five on zero, the players will be like robots and they're always going to do the same read in the game. And then if, I'm, if we're playing against that, if my team are smart because we, we play through a game's approach, straight away after two possessions, we will be able to recognize the pattern that you are running as your baseline out of bounds and we will neutralize it. However, if you are able to make four, three, four, five different reads out of the play, which you can only get by practicing at five on five, that is very difficult to stop because it's kind of like pick your poison. We can choose to guard you as a defense anyway, but you always has a, have a solution as the offense to counter that. And if you do a lot of five on zero, you don't have those poison antidotes. You just have one pattern which your players know, and that's all they get used to running. So, however, I would say this as well, Diego, a great thing that you can do especially with some set plays. Say you'll get to under 16s and you want one set play maybe. Um, there is a degree to just memorizing the basic pattern and then going off the reads. So a great solution to that is doing what I call a mixed drill, where you could do one trip five on zero and then come back playing five on five. So that would mean we could you know, transition. We've got five players. We go down the court and we go into our set play, five on zero. But then we come back and it's against... 5v5 against defenders or you just use one or two defenders to kind of make it a little bit variable within within the, the play so they're having to make a read all right that's just something really small you can do but if you can do that you'll you'll see crazy crazy differences um and you know even with pro coaches i think at the pro level players are obviously they've played a lot longer so they have context which kids don't have because they've had hundreds of hours of practices and game reps but a young kid doesn't have that so the pro practice, you're going to see a lot more on-air stuff because the players know that. They can make reads. But just because we see something at the pro level doesn't mean we do it at the youth level. Andrea Trinchieri says, you know, it's like two different sports, pro basketball and youth basketball. And I, I, I can see what he means. So, uh, Sophia, uh, take us to another question. Uh, I would do the same question that um, this idea between playing by set plays or playing by concepts, by ideas, uh, which, uh, which is uh, for you the age that, that you can uh, transform one thing to the other? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I, I developed a whole offensive structure at Elite Academy. Um, and for me, the only time, even with U18, and I think this is where basketball is going, I use the analogy of jazz music versus classical, okay? And classical is what we see a lot high level Europe. And I'm not saying it's wrong. This is like EuroLeague with set plays. It's classical, right? I'm a, I, I played jazz saxophone. So I used to play in a kid in an orchestra and a jazz band. And just like in the classical, you have notes, which you follow. That to me is just set plays. What I want is to just play with concepts and actions. All right. So that means that we have some, like jazz, we have some basic spacing rules, i.e., could be five out, could be four out, one in. But the players have freedom to run actions. So could be coming for a pick and roll. It could be a dribble handoff. It could be setting an away screen, a pin down. So I want to teach them actions and then players just play off that and they make jazz music and improvise. But oh, now, I think this is where the game is going. If we watch the NBA, it's full of jazz type offenses. I'm not talking the Utah jazz. I'm talking this style. Conceptual offense is what we call it. All right. It's a lot more freelance running actions, etc. In Europe, we see a lot more set based basketball. It's a lot more coach controlled. I think the game is moving more towards the NBA type basketball with conceptual offense. And we saw New Zealand in the World Cup. A great example of that. Um, I think that's where the game is going. So for me, if I was a youth coach now, I'd be preparing my players in this way. Now, having said that, playing classical is still very effective using set plays. To me, the only time I want to run a set play is when the ball goes out of bounds, when the referee touches the ball. Because any time either we get the ball on a stop or off a score, we are running and playing with crazy pace 
and trying to get an advantage before the defense are even set. So the problem is if you're running with lots of set plays, it means your pace is going to be very low and players aren't going to look for advantages in transition. All right. So for me, anytime the ball goes out of bounds is when we want to, when, when we want to run a set play. So that could be in our front court. If the ball goes out or there's a substitution or a foul, that possession, because the defense are set, that is when we would call something. However, I would use, I would use one alignment and have three different options out of it. I don't like this idea, which we see a lot of coaches have with loads of different structures. So what I mean by that is I would have one set play. Let's take a diamond. Okay. This is an alignment. You can see that's a diamond alignment. All right. I would just have three different options out of this diamond. Could be come off, step up, pick and roll as one. Could be come off, cut, pop, back screen, rip as option two. All right. But you guys get the idea. The same alignment, but we disguise it. Because yet again, going back to this idea of patterns, if I recognize that you guys are in a different pattern every time before you run it, my players, if I've done a good job, they recognize that before even I recognize it. Okay. And then neutralize it. So for me, set plays only on a dead ball, even U18s. And if I was coaching a pro team, all right, if it was like in the G League or the NBA, this conceptual offense is more common. But even if it was in Europe, I would still play in this way with faster actions, quick triggers to, to get into offense because I believe that's the future of the game and it's different. All right, it's not slow, it's not set, set based, etc. Hope that answers the question. Uh, I went off. Under, under 14. Uh, that balance that we spoke about the playing uh, uh, two on two or three or three or playing five on five in under 14 um, how much time do you think it's better to to do it in practice the five I'd on spend five more, sure i'd spend for sure i'd spend more time on a small sided games than 5v5 five, five, five. you have to play 5v5 five, because the game is played 5v5 five, rules etc But I'd say, like, say I had, a, I don't know, say I had two practices a week, which were an hour and a half, maybe between, like, 30 and 45 minutes of that would be, would be five on five. And a lot of the time, guys, I would load up my drills to finish five on five. So what I mean by that with the load stuff is, let's say we have a really simple one-on-one -on -one right here. So the offensive player, this is my favorite one-on-one -on -one start that's static. Offense has the ball, okay? He's facing the basket. Defender is facing the basket too. So the defender's blind. He, he's got his back to the offensive player. This is called blind 1v1. The offense can drive either way off him, and it's live as soon as the defense sees him pass, all right? It's a 1v1. We can load that up to 5v5. So we can load it 2v2 now, same start. 3v3, 4v4, and then we get to 5v5. So that Swiss Army knife idea, which we spoke about, you know, I challenge you as coaches, can you take your drills from 1v1 and then, you know, go all the way up, progress it to 5v5? Not, it doesn't just mean playing as a scrimmage, as a five-on-five -five scrimmage in your practice. Uh, Alex, ideas to practice the fast break with defenders? No three-man weave. All right, or if you like three-man weave, Just add a defender, all right? If, if you love three-man weave, just add one defender in and see the difference that it makes, okay? Now, great question. What I would say on that is the best thing for actually teaching transition is not always transition drills because the players know what the emphasis is. That thing which I just showed you with the, the 1v1 start, just add in trips. So as soon as we don't do it here, it could be two on two, three on three, four on four, five on five. As soon as we do it, now we're transitioning. All right, and this is why I do a lot in my drills. I never like to finish the drill on the shot. It's not realistic. You've got to link in all four phases of the game. So the four phases of the game we have, we have half court defense, okay? Then we have transition offense. Then we have half court offense, transition defense, okay? It's like a cycle, a cycle. We want our drills to try and include multiple cycles. That is game-like. We just don't want to be one. So as soon as we've done our one-on-one, uh, our, one -on -one, our blind start here, regardless of the format, i.e. two-on-two, three-on-three, transition immediately to going and playing on the other basket. So now you're getting in transition. You're getting in half-court. 
you can then add another trip back, transition defense. So you're working on all these different things from one activity. All right. So I don't always like this idea of just doing a transition offense drill because then players know what's coming. Disguise it, mix it into the other stuff you're working on your practices. One, one question, I think it's more philosophically. Um, in Portugal, we're always speaking about this, uh, playing pick and roll in under 14. You think it's about the age or about the knowledge of the players? Yeah, it's about the skill for sure. It's, for me, I define it as the moment your players can no longer create an advantage through playing dynamic 1v1. So what I mean by that is the moment you start playing against a good defense and your players find it difficult to create an advantage through other things, through dynamic 1v1, that's when I think you start to introduce pick and roll. But what I mean by dynamic 1v1, guys, so for me, with my youth, say I was coaching a youth team, all right, so let's say the ball is right here. This is an example of good spacing. So my pen's going. So it's a four out one in. So we got the dunker spot. We're not on the block. We're on the weak side dunker. And then we got corners, both filled, and the other players on the 45. So it's, tr it's untraditional four out. Traditional four out is like this. But I don't like the spacing because there aren't double gaps. So here, you can see we got great double gap. So dynamic 1v1 if the ball's here is a cut, a blast cut from a double gap into a single gap. We receive the ball and we play from there. That to me is what I would do all the time with a U14 team, U12, just teach them dynamic 1v1 because then they learn everything they need to know. If he's overplayed, he cuts back door. He's going to dribble. Next dynamic cut, blast cut comes from here. All right. So I would teach all of that stuff first. I've got a lot of clinics on it. If you guys are interested, I'm looking for my rub. Yeah, if you're interested in that, I've got whole clinics on that. Dynamic 1v1 first. And then once I've spent a lot of time on that, before I look at pick and roll, I would introduce a gets action. So a gets action is a stationary handoff. It's a throw and go. So a gets is this. We got the ball here. Let's say we got this player in the short corner. He's sprinting up. He's going to receive the pass. And then he sprints to get it back. As a, it's kind of like a dribble handoff but without the dribble. This is way better than dribble handoffs. I think if you do dribble handoffs at four teams, disaster. This leads to dynamic 1v1. Because now if he's overplayed, he might cut back door, might have to curl, might have to shoot, all right? So I would teach gets first. And then I think if, if, if you do a good job with that, you're probably not going to need pick and roll. If you have an exceptional group of kids who can do all of that really easily, they can play amazing dynamic 1v1, they can shoot, they can do no-look passes, they can penetrate and kick, then you can start introducing pick and roll. Because pick and roll is obviously a key part of the game. 42% of possessions at the NBA level always or, uh, end with a, or start with pick and roll. You've got to do it, but the other skills are more important first. And I think the problem we have with pick and roll is when it becomes just an easy tactic to be transactional and win games. And it's just two players involved. One player goes to pick, rolls, the other player comes off it. No other players get touched of the ball. No other players learn. The pick and roll is a five-man game. It's not a two-man game. All the three other players have to read and react. So for me, the problem is when we teach pick and roll as that two-man game and not as a five-man game. And one last question, uh, Alex, and uh, thank you for all these explanations. S such a good presentation. Uh, this is, I think, a really good question to close because that's the, um, a really big reality in Portuguese basketball that... Uh, our groups, our teams are really different uh, inside the team. So we have a lot of different players with different uh, knowledge of the game and different uh, uh, physical abilities. So with this kind of uh, practice, with a lot of uh, playing time, uh, if the players are so many different from each other, what kind of strategies do you think it's good to use? That's, this is where you've got to be smart and creative as a coach because you've got to find a way to still challenge the better players, all right? But then the weaker players who still need more time to develop have to be happy too, right? So for me, this is where using constraints would be critical. So let's say I have a really dominant player who's really big and strong, all right? You're not allowed to score inside the paint anymore. 
All right, that's just an example of a constraint. I've got a player who's really right-hand dominant. You're not allowed to, uh, to finish or to pass with your right hand anymore, All right? So I'm putting my best players, I'm thinking of different ways I can constrain them, but still play with everyone. So they're still getting better at the same time as everyone else while working on new skills, all right? I think the biggest thing we see is probably the big, um, the early matures, the players who grow early and who are big early, all right? And we often mistake those players at this age group for being the most talented, whatever. I don't know even what talented means, to be honest with you, but we mistake those players to be the best and we miss out on some of the players who are maybe uh, born later on in the year, relative age effect, who are maybe younger and need more time to grow. And they're actually the better long-term prospect. So for me, I think you've got to be the most careful with the players who are not just the most skilled, but the ones who are athletically stronger and think about ways that you can challenge them and make it harder for them. Um, something I love just watching the, the last dance on Netflix. You know, I was, I was kind of watching it with a coach's eye to try and figure out what I could learn as a coach. And I, there was one, I can't remember what episode, but MJ was playing and Jackson sub, he, he took, Phil Jackson took MJ from one team and he put him on the other team. And he had developed like a lead in the, in the, in the drill or whatever. He, MJ was killing it and he'd like created like a plus eight lead. And then suddenly he had to change bibs with someone else. And now he was eight points down. So for me, like Jackson probably wouldn't have called that a constraint. That is a great example though, of a constraint that you can use to kind of push and challenge your, your, your best, so to speak, players. Alex, thank you so much. Hey, Alex, thank you for being with us uh, and sharing your, uh, your ideas, your experience. Uh, it was a good opportunity, an amazing opportunity to work with you again. And uh, I hope in the future we can do it again, okay?